Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our first Connect group discussion on our preaching series during the month of March, the E-Word. We are addressing the word evangelism, a word that many Christians shy away from. They try to avoid because it carries all kinds of negative connotations. But uh, we're seeing in this series that it's actually supposed to be good news not bad news, and we're going to be learning some strategies on how we can share our faith, which is a commandment of Christ, how we can do that effectively. Hey, if you're watching this series and you're not in Connect Group, let me encourage you, you can watch it anyway, you can watch this teaching, but there's nothing quite like being in Connect Group because you'll have an opportunity after the video to uh, get in some discussion and talk about how this message will encourage you and get some takeaways. So you can watch it on the Uversion app yourself, but as I say, Get to Connect Group, join a Connect Group if you're not in one, it'll do you good and it's the best place for you to grow and mature spiritually. Well, I want to talk for a few moments and then I'm going to introduce a video from Bo that actually addresses today's topic. And I was going to put it in my own words, but I decided that Bo does such a great job of it, there's no point in me reinventing the wheel. So you'll be able to watch what he has to say about this topic of how to be bold but not pushy. Uh, because that's the fear that so many of us have, that if I become too bold, I'll come across as one of those obnoxious Christians that, uh, that everyone wants to keep away from. And so Bo is going to show us in that video how not to do that, how to be uh, bold but not pushy. A couple of things I wanted to maybe have you think about. You may not have thought of these things, but it's important to understand that we are living in what we call a postmodern world. And uh, one of the problems with that is that people tend to be, oh, it's not, not really a problem, I guess, it's just a, the way it is, is that our society, our culture, is becoming largely experienced-based. And once upon a time, people wanted to know if something was true. They sort of elevated truth to the highest standard. And as Christians, we know that truth is high. Jesus never uh, lowers truth. Uh, the world is trying to lower truth and say truth is relative. What works for you doesn't have to work for me. If it's good for you, that's great, but it doesn't have to be good for me. Uh, you can say a certain standard is truth, whereas I say something else is true. That's what the world says. But as Christians, we have to refute that because Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. And he has a standard by which we have to live. So we uphold the value of truth, but we need to understand that in order to be effective in reaching people, we need to not just continue to uh, put that standard of truth out as our first point with most people. Because most people today don't want to know if something's true, they want to know if it works. Don't tell me that Jesus is, some, is, is truth or whatever. Don't tell me that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. How does that apply to my life? How can I use that in my life? People want to see the message of the gospel working and then they're more open to accepting the truth of the gospel. It's not that we water down truth. It's not that we shouldn't address truth. At some point we do. A person cannot be converted to Christ without embracing the truth of the gospel. But I'm just saying it's not always the best starting point. You need to look for opportunities to show people how Christ will work in their life and how Christ has worked in your life. And then over time, when they begin to see Jesus works, they'll begin to put their faith that Jesus may indeed be the truth, which he is. So we're trying to stay away from being the obnoxious street corner believer who stands there and just and just proclaims and everyone sneers at them, looks at them, thinks how obnoxious are they? I don't want you to be that kind of Christian. I don't believe God wants you to be um, be pushing people away. He wants you to bring people to him. And so understanding how many people work today is important. And Bo's going to talk about that in just a moment. So here's a pattern as I introduced Bo's video, a pattern of some things that you can do to begin to look for opportunities to share your faith. It's a sad fact, but a true fact that most Christians today don't have any meaningful friendships or many meaningful friendships outside the church. We spend so much time together, and we should, but the potential byproduct of that is we never build relationships with people outside the church. And so you can do, start, do so by starting to determine, I'm going to build some friendships. I'm going to build some relationships in my workplace, with my next door neighbour, with that mum I see in the schoolyard when we're dropping our kids off every week, in my university, wherever I am, I'm going to go out of my way to build relationships. And not be overly preachy with them, 
Look, in, an, in a relationship, you need to treat your faith like it's normal. So when an opportunity comes up to share your faith, share about your faith or share about Christianity, don't shy away from it completely. If someone says, what did you do on the weekend? Don't find every excuse to say everything else you did, but don't say I went to church. Just say, oh, I was in church and it was great. Now, you might not have to be overly preachy about that. And they might just go, that's cool. Or they might ask you more questions. But don't be afraid to say that. If nothing else, it begins them. To, it, it helps them to see that well. This person's a believer. This person has a spiritual understanding. Now it may not come to any more, but you've started a conversation by being real about who you are, and the relationship will be built on a healthy foundation. And then what happens is you're always looking for opportunities. If, if you've got a genuine bridge of friendship with people, then they'll begin to share their challenges with you, and you, you'll be looking for opportunities to uh, life challenges they're facing to bring up about spiritual matters. And uh, we're going to discuss that throughout this series. I think it's probably the next Connect Group discussion we'll be talking about that. We're gonna talk about how you can uh, enter into people's lives, genuinely care for them, and bring up spiritual matters, especially when they're facing challenges. You can ask questions when a person shares a struggle with you, whether it's a, it might be a marriage situation or a financial problem or something that they've got. Ask questions, simple questions like, have you considered where God might be in this situation? Uh, would you be open to talking about that? Or say, you know what, I, I went through something similar myself and it wasn't easy, but, but I, I'm so grateful that I had Jesus in my life and he helped me. Would you be interested in that, talking about that? Or even you could just say, that really, really is hard. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear you going through that. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Because I believe God can help you. He's helped me in situations like that, and I believe he can help you. Now, notice that it might be a little bit awkward to say those conversations, but you all know it's not pushy. That's just actually it's showing genuine concern and care. In fact, if you didn't say anything at that time, then I actually think you would be regarded as being unloving. So it's naturally loving just to engage people and share about God in those situations. And if they're open, you can invite them to talk more or pray more at another time or even right there. But if they're not open, that's the point, as you're going to see when you watch the video from Bo, you're going to see that's the point at which you just back down and don't keep being pushy. If you keep being pushy at that point, you, you'll keep pushing on, you'll be the pushy, obnoxious person. But if you just back down and just uh, say, hey, I'm here for you. If you need to talk at any point, I'm here. And just let the relationship continue spiritually. Don't have a problem with that. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, another point that Bo makes in the book, and then we'll go straight to the video. Bo talks about uh, how people have a journey to Christ. And we, we have this mentality that, oh, they'll come to a certain point in their life, and one minute they're, they're so far away from God, and the next minute they become a believer. But we talked last month about discipleship and how it's a journey from the point of conversion to the point of maturity. And it's important to understand that on the other side of the spectrum, there's also a journey. There's a journey to Christ, and then there's a journey of growing in Christ. And so people can be moving along the process towards conversion, just in the same way that they can be moving on the process towards maturity. And so people may enter an altar call on Sunday in church, but they may not actually be converted at that time. And you need to give people space for that. And Bo talks about it this way. He says, there's a difference between what he calls an awakening moment and a believing moment. Now, an awakening moment is a, is a process, is a part of the journey where a, a person is starting to discover God, starting to search for God. Maybe they do answer an altar call. Maybe they engage you in conversation and they don't fully grasp what it means to repent of their sins and turn to Christ. But God's starting to work in them. Chances are you experienced the same thing in your life, and I did in my life too. I know there was a journey of a few months at least where I was awakening to God before I understood what I did and made a commitment to Christ. And don't force people into that conversion moment. Understand that it's okay for them to be starting to sense God and feel God and search for God, and that's okay. The awakening is fine. There will come a point at which they'll understand it and they'll be ready to make a believing moment. And so Bo talks about that, and it's important that you understand it because that way, if a person talks about faith with you, but they're not ready to come to Christ, maybe you might say, do you want to give your life to Jesus? Or would you come to church? And they say, oh, I'm not ready for that yet. That doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that you have to shake the dust off your feet and say, well, you had your chance. You'll go to hell. I'm going to go and find someone else. It doesn't mean that. Embrace the fact that it's a journey, keep loving them, keep sharing with them, keep being in their world, and over time, they will 
preferably, hopefully, come to that point where they'll meet Jesus. All right, have an incredible week. Uh, we're going to put this video on. You're going to be able to watch this video from Bo now and then have your discussion questions in your Connect group. And I know it's going to be great for you. God bless. Thanks so much for your comments, your engagement, for sharing the first video. It's just so exciting, so energizing to be able to help you learn how to be a more bold witness for Jesus. In the first video, if you didn't see it, we talked about how do we embrace awkward so we can move through and see breakthrough in our friends' lives. Embracing awkward, tension, nervousness that comes up in sharing our faith, none of us like that. It freaks us out. It makes us uncomfortable. But what we talked about is that if we don't embrace awkward and realize that some awkwardness actually comes from God, we're not going to see the breakthrough that we want to see in our friends' lives. I told you three incredible stories. One of uh, a person that took nine years until the breakthrough happened. Another with my neighbor that took two years. And then one with my sister-in-law that happened in one precious night. Embracing awkward in order to see breakthrough could happen over a long period of time or could happen in one single moment. We just don't know. But what our job is, is that we need to embrace it, welcome it, and then learn to move past it. I've learned some incredible things as I've helped people learn to share their faith. Thousands of people, things that are really working, things that aren't. And one thing that we need to learn in this section is to realign our thinking so that we can unhook ourselves from another barrier that comes up as we start to share our faith. In order to be an effective witness for Jesus, we have to embrace awkward, but we also need to realign the way we think about pushiness and boldness. You see, you can embrace awkward, and you may have mustered up that kind of strength from the past video. I'm going to embrace awkward. I'm going to step into one of those awkward tensions that I have with a family member or a coworker. But another barrier that will instantly shoot up, even if we embrace the awkward, is how do I know I'm not going to come across pushy? I'm in the moment, but I don't want to be pushy. And I don't want you to be pushy either. What I want to help you learn how to do in this video is to discern and differentiate the difference between being pushy and being bold. We want to be bold, but we don't want to be pushy. We all want that. The problem is, though, that we quickly um, kind of correlate the two. We tend to think that pushiness and boldness is one and the same. Now, we may not say that consciously right here, right now, but if you think about it deep down, we tend to connotate the two. We tend to think that being pushy is being bold, or being bold means that you have to be pushy. And that's too bad. I think that's because we've had people that are more extroverted or more outgoing that have come across bold in some moments, but also pushing others. And so we tend to throw the baby out of the bathwater and just say, being bold for Jesus, being radical for Jesus, that's just too pushy. It's one thing for us to embrace awkwardness and be committed to moving through that to see breakthrough, but it's an entirely different thing to understand once we're in a moment, how do we know if we're coming across pushy or bold? So let me tell you a story about my uh, friend Jim. Jim is a neighbor of mine. He's a 50-year-old uh, Buddhist guy, and we've been having a relationship for the last couple years since I moved into my house as well. And he invited me out to a golf tournament a few weeks ago into his group of friends. I felt so honored that he would ask me to come do that with him. And while we're in the middle of the round, I turned to him and I said, Jim, thanks so much for bringing me out here. This is awesome that you would include me in this round of golf and with your friends. And he turned to me and he said, Bo, you're one of the most caring and compassionate guys that I've ever met. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to bring you out here with that. And internally, I mean, I was totally uh, honored by that, but I was chuckling because if you know me very well, the first word you would not use to describe me is compassionate. I mean, I'm a nice guy, but you wouldn't say compassionate. And what was interesting furthermore about that is this is a guy that I've had lots of conversations about Jesus with, and he's never once accepted the offer to connect with God or to follow Jesus. We've had countless awkward moments where it almost just ended in silence. And so the question that it begs me to ask is, how come Jim, even though we've had so many awkward moments, I've shared the gospel with him boldly, and he said, no, it's not for me. How come he still sees me as compassionate and loving and as a caring guy in his life that he wants to invite into his friend circle more deeply? How could he possibly see me that way if I've been so bold with him and he hasn't even wanted what I've had to offer? 
because I've learned the difference between being pushy and bold. You see, my neighbor could call me that compassion and caring, even though I've had very bold um, conversations about Jesus where he turned down even the opportunity to have a relation with God. He can call me that because I was bold in those moments, but I wasn't pushy. And so I want to dive right in now and help you understand exactly what that looks like. What are these terms? How am I using them? And how you can become bold but not pushy. So if you look at this continuum, it spans from timid to pushy. Most people in our population fall in one of two of those categories, either timid or pushy. And I would say inside of the church, most people are actually timid. Maybe 70% of the people are on the timid side and 30% are the pushy side. The way I would define timid is this. Timidity is someone who perceives another's openness but avoids engaging him or her at all costs. You see, you might have a ton of trust with a friend or a family member. They might even be curious about faith. But because you're so scared of screwing up the relationship, so worried about pushing them away, you don't want to bring up Jesus. So at all costs, you just don't instigate. You don't ever be proactive in starting conversations. You just wait, 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 wait. Even if there's an opening that you can interject yourself into. Pushy people are on the totally other opposite side. Pushy people, the way I would define it is this. They ask a question to start a conversation that he or she intends to dominate. Pushy people have an agenda. They don't listen and kind of their mantra is convert at all costs. It's the people we see publicly that make us just go, gosh, I would never want to be out there with my faith because I don't want to come across like that guy. You know, I have to admit, I've been like that before. And I think that's why I can actually talk to you about this today because I've learned that being pushy never helps someone uh, become bold. But you know what's interesting? Timidity never works either. Both timid people and pushy people have the same thing in common. They want to control the conversation. While timid people and pushy people look completely different if you were to observe them, they both want to control the conversation. Timid people don't ever want to bring it up. They're not open to God moving them into an uncomfortable or awkward moment. And pushy people are controlling it because they can't ever slow down. They see every moment as the God moment, even when it's not. They both want to control. So what we want to do, and what I want to help you do today, is to become aware. Do you tend to be on the timid side or the pushy side? And then let's move to the middle to a much better zone. And this zone is what I would call boldness. and patience. And this is what I always say. We want to be as bold as we can be, but as patient as we need to be. I want to say that again. Our objective, if we're going to move into awkward moments and beyond them, and we're going to become bold people, not pushy, is we want to be people that are as bold as we can be, but as patient as we need to be. That's what will always keep us right here. And what do I mean by that? Timid people, they need to interject themselves more in conversations. There's probably people in their life that are ready right now. If you're more of a timid person, I almost can guarantee you there's someone in your life that would love to have a spiritual conversation with you. You don't need more patience. You've been patient. You need more boldness. You need to be able to interject more. But pushy people, they're probably blasting everyone with the good news. And they're probably getting really annoying. The last thing they need to do is to be more bold. They actually need to learn how to be patient. So again, if a pushy person or a timid person is saying, I want to be as bold as I can be, but as patient as I need to be, they'll actually find themselves in a very relational place, in a loving environment where even people that turn them down, like my neighbor, will say, you're being very caring to me and compassionate. So the burning question then is, how does a pushy person or a timid person become bold? How do we get to that area? And I want to actually help you see in two steps how you can discern this right away if you're being the pushy person or you're being a bold person or you're being stuck in timidity. I'm going to show you that right away. So the first thing is when you take a relationship, say your neighbor, your job as a witness is to be checking the, their curiosity pulse. I call it a curiosity pulse. So I'm going to write a pulse just like that. Your job is to be checking in with them. Well, to be able to do that, you've actually got to break the ice. So number one is break ice. 
Your job as a witness is to check in, to ask a question. So again, as we talked about in the, in the last video, Jesus in John 4 asked the woman at the well a question. Philip in Acts 8 asked the Ethiopian a question. As a witness, they're interjecting, they're seeing, is this person open? That's being bold. You can't tell the difference in step one between a pushy person and a bold person, not yet. Because both pushy people and bold people ask questions and interject and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's step two where you really start to see the difference between someone who's bold and patient and someone who's actually pushy. And that's what I wanna show you right now. Number two is curiosity. What is um, the level of curiosity in the person's life. When you actually ask a person, hey, are you interested in spiritual things? Do you have a spiritual background? Or all the time with my neighbors, when I say to them things like, hey, would you ever wanna have a conversation about faith and learn what it looks like to have a relation with God? Depending what they say right there and how you respond to that will determine if you are a patient and bold person or if you're a pushy person. You're not timid anymore because you've already started and interjected to have a conversation. But when my neighbor um, says to me, you know what, Bo, I'm not interested in that at all. And I then say, no problem, and I shut the conversation down, I'm actually being patient and I'm being bold. It's not unbold for me to shut the conversation down. It's loving. It's responsible. He's not open. My job's not to push him. My job's not to convert him. My job's to help him journey towards God, and he's not open. So I need to be patient and I need to wait on God's timing and I need to keep praying for him. But if I was to ask my neighbor and he was to say, yeah, actually I've been thinking a lot of things about God and I have no one to talk to and I'd love to talk sometime. Well, he's curious, uh, curiously open and I need then to become more bold and I need to go further into that moment no matter how awkward it could be. That's not pushy, that's loving. It's bold, it takes some nerve for you to be able to step into that, but it's the right thing to do, it's the loving thing to do because he wants to talk. That's what it means to be bold. So these two steps, breaking the ice and checking their curiosity is how we discern if we need to be patient, if we need to be more bold, or if we're becoming pushy. If you do those well, you won't need to worry about, I'm becoming the pushy guy. You'll know, I need to be more bold or I need to be more patient. It's one of those two actions. But once we're there, there's two practices we always want to keep living inside of to help us stay inside the patient pulled zone. And to illustrate those two practices, I want to tell you a story about a time I lived at the beach with my neighbors. So for my last year of college and then the two years after college, I had the opportunity to live at the beach right down on the boardwalk front row. Like literally, if you went off my porch, you're going to hit the sand. I mean, it was unbelievable. But what that brought with it was I lived next to some crazy guys. I mean, they, they were really fun, but just imagine this. They were guys that had six TVs in their living room, you know, 22, 23 year old guys, had every football game on Sunday on in there. But sometimes when I'd walk in the house, they'd have pornography on, or they'd be doing drugs, or just crazy stuff that made them very interesting to engage with. But I loved spending time with them, playing volleyball, watching football, playing cards, whatever it was. I loved these guys, but I wanted them to know God. I wanted them to be transformed by God. I wanted them to know their loving Father in heaven. So pretty quickly after I lived there, I, I let them know I'm Christian and I'd love for you to be Christian too. And I, in my own way, helped them know that I wanted to talk to them about faith. But right away, they made it clear, not interested, Bo. In fact, one of the guys was a total hardcore atheist, and from that point forward, he would always make fun of me, calling me preacher man or whatever it was, and they just started heckling me and hazing me. So at that point, I had to decide, am I going to continue to push for them to want them to hear the gospel and to respond to God, or am I going to be patient and wait on God's timing? And because I was growing as a witness and I want to be effective, I decided that I was actually going to learn to be patient. And if someone is on the pushy side, I wasn't pushy yet, but since I was being bold with them to try and talk about my faith, it was starting to push me towards the side, especially once they said they weren't open. So to become now patient, once I'm kind of over in here, I had to do something really important, and that was to commit to being present to them. Giving them my presence. You see, 
When you are bold with someone and they tell you it's not time or you start to realize they're not open, it's not the right time, right? Because patient people, bold people realize not every moment is a God moment. Pushy people think every moment's a God moment. Once they declare they're not open, they don't want this, and I realize I don't want to be annoying to them, I have to fall back now into a mode of saying I'm going to be present in their life. I'm going to hang out with them. I'm going to play volleyball with them. I'm going to watch football with them. I'm going to play cards with them. I'm going to be their friend. And for me, because I'm so used to talking about my faith and I'm comfortable with it, I actually made a commitment that I'm not even going to bring up God with them ever. I know that sounds really alarming since I'm an evangelist that I would say I won't bring up God. But I made my intentions clear and they said no. So the best way to love them and the most effective way to be a witness to them was to really ramp up being present to them and being their friend and not talking about it. They knew who I was and what my intentions were. Remember, we want to be as bold as we can be, but as patient as we need to be. So I was obviously being very bold with them and I wanted to be bold. But once I realized I was gonna become pushy if I kept talking about my faith with them, I had to become as patient as I needed to be. And that meant committing to not bringing up my faith, to being present to them, and waiting for God to bring it up again. So here's the deal. If you tend to be towards pushiness, let's say you're a pushy person watching this and you realize you've been coming across that a lot. Or maybe you're not pushy yet, but you've just been bold with some people and there's closed doors or closed hearts and you wanna become more patient and therefore commit to presence, there's three things that I wanna encourage you to do to help you move from the pushy side back towards the bold and patient side. And here's the three things you can do. One is commit to not bringing up Jesus. Don't confuse this. What I'm not saying is don't ever bring up Jesus. What I'm saying here is if you've already brought him up and been very bold and made it clear, your roommates, your coworkers, your neighbors, your family members know that you want to talk about God and they say, not right now, then you need to commit to not bringing it up. And the second thing is spend more time with people. Spend more time with them. Commit to not talking about God. You've already been on the pushy side. And commit to being present to them and showing them the love of God and who you are. Allow the space for them to bring it up once more trust is built. And then talk about faith once they bring it up. The third thing is, if you're more of a pushy person, ask your friends for feedback. This is the thing that saved me when I was starting to become more pushy when I was younger. I asked loving people around me, am I coming across pushy? Am I coming across uh, creepy or uncomfortable? And when some of them told me, yeah, man, you need to chill out a little bit, I had the opportunity to listen to that and be humble and grow or to be prideful and say, I'm just gonna keep doing what I want. So to recap that, if you wanna become more patient and you're tending towards pushiness, Commit to not bringing up Jesus in those relationships, spend more time with them, and ask your friends for feedback. So we can also, on the other hand, spend as much time with our friends as possible, be as present to them um, as we can be. But if we're never intending to bring up Jesus, that's not gonna be helpful either. Now, of course, I'm talking about people on the timid side. People on the timid side are probably pretty good at presence. They're probably in relationships, they're in friendships but you're not intending to bring up Jesus. It's never on your mind. It never occurs to you, maybe I should start a spiritual conversation. It freaks you out. The last thing you need is more presence. That's not gonna bring you to the middle. That's gonna bring you more to timidity. What you need is you actually need more proclamation. You need to proclaim Jesus. You need to proclaim the, Jesus, uh, the gospel in some of your relationships. You need to commit to starting some spiritual conversations. Your problem is the opposite problem. And again, there are probably are people in your life, if you're a timid person watching this, that are open and ready to talk about faith, but you've never brought it up. You've never declared to your friends, I'd love to talk with you if you've had questions. You've never asked your friends, do you have questions about faith? You've never invited them to church or Bible study or whatever it is. What you need to do is actually open your mouth and talk about God, and I know that's scary, but if you do, I think there's gonna be people that are ready to talk about faith with you. So how would you do that? How would you become more proclaiming, more bold, if you're someone that's in the timid camp, if you've been living there? Well, I have three quick points for you too. One is analyze your approach. When you look at the relationships you spend time with as a timid person, are there any of your relationships that you're bringing up God in? Do any of your relationships know that you'd like to have a conversation with them about faith? 
Have you invited them to anything spiritual? I mean, analyze it. Be honest with yourself. Try and be as humble as you can and, and, and look at it and see, actually, no, none of my relationships I'm bringing up faith or maybe one out of 10. And my suggestion to you is pick one more of those relationships where you're not bringing up faith, maybe one of the safest ones, and ask them a question to see if they're open uh, to talk about Jesus and see what God does. It will be awkward and tense for you, I know. But if you give God that space, I bet he's going to move in a breakthrough type of way. The second thing is gauge the curiosity. This is what I want to encourage you as a more timid person. It's not pushy to constantly be gauging the curiosity of your friends. Listen, with my neighbor who tells me I'm not interested right now, well, three months later, I might ask him again. That's okay. If you're inside of a safe, loving relationship that's ongoing, it's okay to let them know that you want to talk about faith and bring it up every two or three months. I'm not saying every day or every time you hang out, with, but check their curiosity. That, that can change. A huge mistake timid people make is once a friend says they're not open, they think that they're not open forever. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. People change over months and years. So check back in, gauge their curiosity. Thirdly, ask a bolder friend for help. In the same way I encourage the pushy person to ask their friends for feedback, I want to ask you and encourage you as a timid person to ask a bolder friend to give you help. Maybe invite them over and ask them to give you advice about a relationship you have. Is there anything they would say or do that would be different than you? Sometimes when we ask bolder people to help us think about our relationships when we're more timid, they have insights that we can't even access because we're so scared. And it will unlock you and bring freedom to you and confidence and assurance that you actually can take a step of more bold faith and not hurt your relationship.